swing and a high drive in the center field. Hits at the wall. It is gone. Passes does it again. Again. It's gone. It's into the bullpen. This game is tied. This game is tied. He swings and rips one to center field. It's high. It's deep. It's back. It's gone. Sale winds. He fires. Swing and miss. Strike three. It's over. What's up? Welcome back to Play Tessie. It is episode 60, and if you're listening on Drop Day, it is April 3rd. So episode 60, I was gonna I was gonna call it the Henry Owens episode. I'm here with Sammy and Pat Coops in the back. Uh, but guys, I think I I should just read off the names of the players who have worn number 60 for the Red Sox and just like let you guys bask in the glory that is this list. Oh. All right, here we go. The first one didn't happen till 05. I'm just gonna read them down. Hanley Ramirez, David Murphy, David Pauley, Jonathan Van Every, Daniel Bard, Daniel Nava, Scott Schoenweiss, Ryan Lavarnway, Yamiko Navarro, Ryan Lavarnway again, Brian Vill- Villarreal, who we've been who we have talked about <laughs> like all too recently. He Henry- comes up so much on this show. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Henry Owens, Yairo Munoz, the uh hit streak king from Worcester and then Tyler Danish is the most recent number 60 for the Red Sox. How about how about that? My, list. My biggest takeaway from that list is if you are a utility player coming up from AAA, you get the number 60. It's built in. It's built into it's their in. it's it's that You're contract. Contractually contractually obligated to wear six zero on on your back. You know who never really got a like I'm a prospect number is Devers. They just gave him a sick number right off the bat. Yeah. Here's 11. Sticks. It's all yours. But like, what did Pedroia, Pedroia had 64. That's huh. gross. You have to deal with that. Yeah, like even even some of the other recent top prospects, like Benintendi had to take a higher number. Like, Bayo, I, who the hell knows what, what happened with Bayo because he just kept it. Like, I don't, we don't know if that was his or if he – I don't know. He, they probably just gave it to him and he kept it. I think double numbers are kind of sick, regardless of what they are. Like yeah. 66, you never really see a guy with 66. What's the, like, Arredondo from the Angels in the early 2000s? The only 66. I love I that guy. That is so random that you brought what number, him. What number is David fan. Wells? Oh, just Wasn't, He three? was 13. Or no, it's three. You're right. He was three, yeah. and then he switched with Edgar Renteria to be 16, I think. Dude, I he, think- you know what he likes, Gordo? He likes ham steaks. Yeah. Oh God. The only reason the only reason I guess David Wells is because I figured he'd have to have two big numbers to cover that wide back of his. Oh wide. ham steak. But this is the official podcast of the Charlie the Unicorn fan club, also known as the official Red Sox podcast of WEI. Before we get going, hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening. Uh, Odyssey app, Apple, Spotify. Hit that subscribe button and rate us five stars. YouTube, we're on the WEI channel. Uh, you, su- you should subscribe to that. Rate us five stars there. Leave a comment. We love hearing from you guys. Um, but yeah, here with Sammy and Pat Coops in the back. We're going to talk a little bit about the rotation because as we record this podcast, the Red Sox have made one turn through the rotation and to pretty much probably every baseball fan and analyst and everyone's surprise, this Red Sox rotation to this point has been the best starting rotation in baseball. After all offseason, everyone had said they need improvements. They need to sign not just one ace, but two aces. Giolito goes down there and they traded sale. Oh, my God, they need two or three pitchers. And this isn't to say that that stuff is false now because it's obviously just been one turn through the rotation. But what we have seen is ridiculous. It is so impressive. They are undisputed. They've undisputedly put up the best numbers of any starting rotation in baseball. And you can, you can expand it. If you include the bullpen, they're the best staff in baseball. It's, it's crazy. I, Sammy, Pat, like what, how shocked are you that we have gotten this level of production from the starting pitching? Dude. I mean, how many times did I say, Oh, Andrew Bailey's great. Kyle Bodie's great. I'm glad they added all this new pitching infrastructure, but it's going to take a long time for it to really start working. Me too. I just look like a complete idiot now. Literally, the first turn through the rotation, everybody looks completely different. So, 
I have to go back to the drawing board in terms of how much I think I know because Jesus, getting rid of the four seam fastball. If you told me that was the plan, I'd, I'd say you're crazy. How do you pitch without a, a four seam fastball? But man, the game is changing and it's nice to see the Red Sox changing with the game because we look at them as such an old franchise to see them adapting on the fly. Really nice as a fan. Yeah, uh, I'm same boat as Sammy. Uh, I think literally the day before opening day, I was absolutely shitting on Whitlock and Hauk being in the rotation. They turned in the two best starts of the first turn in the rotation. But like Sammy said, like the best that like I was just thinking about this because I knew we we're going to be talking about not using the fastball. And Sammy said it very well in terms of it's an old school approach to rely on the fastball. Andrew Bailey, Jim McCaffrey tweeted a quote from him about how the fastball is like a jab. You can't win a fight with one with jabs. Like Great you got to set it up power shots with the jab, like all this stuff. Smarter man than I, but the best way I can put it is, and this is going to sound insane. Coca-Cola used to put cocaine in Coke. Then you realize, wait a minute, there's a better way to do this. Andrew Bailey took the cocaine out of the Coca-Cola. This is a winning formula. Guys are pitching backwards. Guys literally are not throwing fastballs. Teams know. Now they know. They will not see fastballs. And they still cannot hit the off-speed stuff. It's yeah. insane how quickly we are seeing the results of this new infrastructure, this new approach, in the way that they're co- they're not walking, guys. Corey Kluber signed here as a control specialist in walk the merry-go-round under Dave Bush. They're yeah. not walking people, never mind the strikeouts. I love that a quote Andrew Bailey said, relentlessly attacking the strike zone. Yes. Everything Andrew Bailey says is so cool. I feel like he can do no wrong in Boston at this moment. Things change, as we know, but man, that guy's the talk of the town among Red Sox fans, at least. I want to read you guys a couple of stats that I came up with today. And I just, I don't know, maybe you'll have reactions. Maybe you'll just like have your jaws on the floor. I don't know. The Red Sox, and this is full disclosure coming into Tuesday. So we we are recording this before Brian Bayo's second start. So this is just one turn through the rotation. But ERA, the Red Sox staff has a 1.42 ERA, which is the which is the best. Second best is the Tigers at 1.89. The Red Sox staff has the best K per nine in baseball at 11.77. Next best is Phillies at 11.19. They have the best walks per nine at 1.22 in baseball. Next is the Orioles at 1.75. It's like a half a walk per game more. They have the best whip in baseball at 0.74. Next best is the Tigers at 0.82. They have the best batting average against in baseball at 169. Next best is the Tigers at 173. And they have the third fewest pitches per inning, which if you watched the Red Sox last year, you know is so unbelievably important that these guys get through innings quickly. And as you guys alluded to, it starts with throwing strike one. Yeah, I just... I don't even know what else to say. This is so strange in the best way possible. Do you guys, what do you guys think? Are you, do you, do you buy in? Is this going to continue? Obviously not at this pace. It's legitimately impossible, but are the Red Sox on the verge of becoming the next quote unquote pitching factory team? Yeah. I, I, if everyone adapts this approach, and they're like, I think I said this right when they hired Bailey, or maybe it was after Bodie. Like, there will be guys that this approach works for, and some guys who don't. Especially if you're not using your fastball and your off-speed stuff isn't that great. Like, you're probably a guy who's not going to benefit from this new approach. That being said, obviously they're not going to carry a one-two-nine ERA throughout the season. I would not be surprised if they are top five in walks per nine, though. I don't think they're going to walk guys this year. I think they're going to get swings and misses all season long. I think Mm -hmm. the whole staff, the rotation and the bullpen will be heavy in the strikeout department, low in the walk department. And I think a variation of what we've seen will be, will be um, carried out throughout the season. I think another thing that's important And this kind of explains maybe why the Red Sox were in on Yamamoto. So they say, 
but not as much with Montgomery or any of the veteran guys. When you have a young group of guys, it's easier to get that buy-in. And this is something I got from Lou Merloni. This is not an original take. When you have guys who are in their mid to early 20s and you have a guy like Andrew Bailey come in, who's widely regarded as a great baseball brain and his new infrastructure in terms of pitching, you can get these young guys to go, okay, cool. I'm, I grew up in the era of analytics. I believe what you're preaching. I'm willing to give it a shot. Whereas if you have a, you know, a 35 year old pitcher come in and you're telling him, Hey, I want you to ditch your fastball. That's probably not going to sound too good to a guy who's made it to the majors, stuck around in the majors and had success in the majors. And now you're telling him to change. So I don't want to, completely backpedal on everything we said in the off season about how they need pitching. I still think they could use some pitching, but I do like that they're targeting youth and going after the young guys. So uh, I just hope this buy-in continues. It seems like they're all on the same page. It's nice to see a philosophy. We're noticing similarities between the guys, which is something I, I can't recall experiencing that at any time. There were times when the Red Sox had good pitching, but they were all different guys. These guys are all attacking in a similar fashion. It's like they're a unit. It's just so new and exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the start so far early, but like I said, encouraged. You bring up a really good point about the fact that this staff is full of young guys, guys who are still, I don't want to say trying to find their footing because they're definitely established big leaguers, but they're all guys who should be open to changes to try to take that next step because We've watched these guys for years. They all have great arms. It's just a matter of can you count on them to harness it and to put it all together to put together a full good season. And obviously one turn through the rotation is one turn through the rotation. The league is going to adjust. Like I want to go through some of these guys' pitch repertoire changes. Like the league is going to adjust a little bit. Like the fact that some of these guys like I don't, like Cutter specifically and eh, Cutter and Pavetta I would say changed the most in their arsenal in terms of throwing different pitches like Whitlock changed the most in terms of like his pitch shapes but like Cutter and Pavetta are both leading with their sweeper which they didn't do la like Pavetta learned the sweeper last year and Cutter barely threw it and so now the league is going to learn to adjust and like oh we're going to look for this now like you would you have Bayo who basically ditched the four seamer you have Hauk who entirely ditched the four seamer Whitlock has basically ditched the four seamer and has changed all of his pitch shapes Cutter has brought his sweeper from barely used to now it's his lead pitch Pavetta learned the sweeper last year it was kind of a mix it in pitch now he's leading with it and he's cut his four seam usage down about 20 percent at least there was one start like it's 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 a big change and it's a big change across the board for all five guys so like we'll see, we'll see how it lasts. And like obviously we got to see these guys stay healthy. It's really, really, really encouraging. But yeah, let's I'm I'm very excited to see the second turn through. And and honestly, I'm excited to get into May. Because if these guys are still doing this in May, that's when you can start to get a little bit excited. Quick note on Cutter, and, and apologies if I mentioned this before, but I totally didn't notice this in Fort Myers. He looks much bigger. He looks thicker, like a not like He's ripped or anything, just looks more dense. Like he looks more like a starting pitcher, if that makes sense. He'll never have the height of a guy like Giolito or Hauk or Whitlock, but just bulk-wise, he looks more durable. And that might just be wishful thinking on my part, but just something I noticed. I don't know if you guys agree or not. No, he did get bigger. He he put on like, I forget how many pounds of muscle, but it's like all in his legs. And it's just, he, they're hoping it's going to help him carry into like deeper into games because last year he was cutting off at like 80 ish pitches. This first yeah. start, he was into the mid eighties. Gordo. And that's just the first you, start. Do you, after hearing all the Red Sox players pick Cutter Crawford to be on their Island, do you feel slightly more confident when he's on the mound? Cause now I'm thinking like this guy's unflappable. He could be stranded on a desert Island and he'll spear fish and find food. This pitching shit is nothing to him. So that's literally, like, I'm so I have such a squirrel brain. That's what was going through my head when he was starting <laughs> against Seattle. I'm like this Dude, guy's not scared. He can. It's not him. even. It's not even just that. It when he was. It, I don't know if you guys saw the video of the dance circle with him and Yoshida <laughs> dancing. That dude commanded the circle. I'm sorry, he just did. Yeah, like he was. See, did you guys see Paps tweet about that? What did Paps say about it? I don't I think, think I did. Oh, no one. No one opened their phone. Let me please read this out loud. 
I won't, well, I won't, I saw I won't it, hold up. I, you I read it. I didn't really get the joke. He did edit it, though, I saw. And I didn't see the new version, so maybe. Okay, so if you saw Masa dance, you know that he just kind of, like, bends his knees and starts bouncing a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> Cap quote tweeted the video of Masa and Cutter dancing in the circle and said, can someone teach Masa how to drop it like it's hot or at least back that ass up? Good athletes don't make good dancers. Oh. <laughs> hey, you oh, want to talk, talk about thick well there's the cutter dance though look look at that man command the circle it's like yoshida's dancing and like they're all like hey hey but cutter gets in there and it's like oh shit, like we're pumping our fists oh yoshida dances like a toddler Yesterday, i love it and the red sox are showing their versatility <laughs> maybe a game plan to start but then reese yeah. mcguire you know went out there with garrett whitlock and they changed things up about halfway through the game yeah, you saw in the third time through it, it was basically he started throwing some more sinkers right there and trying to fool the hitter. And the hitters were sitting back waiting for the off speed to yeah, break balls. He got guys there out that is. way. So look at him. He just it is he fun takes to watch these guys right now. I love how they don't give a flying fuck about everything that we and everyone else have said this entire offseason. I am so happy to be currently eating crow with most of my pitching takes. So yeah. keep it up, socks. And before we get into, we got some DMs to get into here. But before we do that, when when I was on radio with Rob, it, he had said he was going to ask me for my top takeaways from from my spring training experience. And then he ended up asking like my top like experiences, like top moments. So I didn't get a chance to say this. But if I was going to say it on the radio, my top takeaway was that in sports, they always talk about how important it is to block out the noise. Like you hear that from Belichick and the Patriots all the time. Like that was always a key point of emphasis. The Red Sox this year, it was clear from the second we got there that they were blocking out the noise. And just, I don't know if it's that they didn't hear it. They don't give a shit about it. They heard it, but are throwing it away. I don't know, but it, it clearly didn't impact them when, when we were there. It clearly has not impacted the pitching specifically, like these starting pitchers who have been told over and over again that they're not good enough. One turn through, they've all said, fuck you, I am good enough. So I, it's been great to see. I'm very excited to see the second second turn through. My biggest takeaway from that trip was Gordo's incredible ability to take out his contact lenses in like 0.2 <laughs> seconds. It's insane. He just goes, Look, oh, I thought you were going to do it. It's insane. Oh, I, I just got lenses, so I'm very I'll much appreciative. <laughs> oh. Look at that. That's what? insane. I mean, that's insane. That's so hard to do. I have to go in the mirror and it takes me 17 tries and he just puts it back in. That's incredible. Ooh, I've been wearing Come these on. things since middle school. I'm a season vet. Oh my God. I'm, I'm, yeah, that's nuts. Oh God, get me off the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, hello. Day. So we got some DMs. So should we, uh, we got... We got a few DMs and we got a couple voicemails after that. So we, we should get into these. So we have time for as many as we can get to. Yeah. Well, we got a DM from Justin. He says, sit on Rafaela has been better than Jackson Churio this year. I'm not surprised one fucking bit. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah, Justin. Love that one. Uh, I, I don't agree with the surprise part. I am surprised, but I love it. It's great. Rafaela has been... As advertised defensively, and I would say better than advertised offensively. So no complaints from me. And the speed too. The speed is game changing as well. Pat, thoughts thoughts on Rafaela versus Jackson Churio? Uh, he. I mean, that's a fact. He has been better than Jackson Churio this year. It's been five games. I would talk to me in June if they are even in the same ballpark. I'll still be surprised, but I will. I'll be just as pumped as Justin. Justin's a Justin's a really good uh, Twitter follow. <laughs> he he does mostly Red Sox and White Sox, but he does like general MLB as well. Very good uh, Twitter follow. Thanks for being entertaining, Justin. All right, I yeah, it's it's been a few games. Jackson Churio, I feel like is going to be like maybe the next like Acuna J Rod type. And I know he was talking yeah. about that recently, like trying to model his game after those guys, but like I hope Small. I hope Sid on Rafaela can just be like all we all I want him to be is like a serviceable bat and he's 
been that to this point, I would say serviceable, maybe a little bit better. And the defense is obviously the defense is going to be great. And he runs. So yeah, I've been impressed. I, and I was not a guy who thought that Rafaela should be on the roster coming into spring training. And he earned the right to have me sit or I don't know, whatever. I, who gives a shit about what I have to say, but by the, by the end of spring training, I definitely believed he should be on the roster. And if anyone's going to go down to triple a, when ref Snyder comes back, I would say it's a brave, not will your, yeah. Yeah. It's gotta be will your, I feel so bad for thick Willie, man. We, we had high hopes for him, but and he'll be fine. He just needs, he definitely needs, he needs the everyday pass. reps. Yeah. Yeah. Chill out a little bit, have some, some edibles and Worcester relax. All right, let's get to the next one. This is from Murph. All right, we've got electric vehicles are all the rage right now. Which Red Sox player would be best improved if they had their bones replaced with electricity? Take this to mean whatever you want it to. Sammy? Definitely Yoshida. He's got the leg issues where he gets tired. If he had electric mm -hmm. legs, he'd be stealing bags. He would play defense. He wouldn't be tired all the time. And he could sprint to Fenway instead of taking a scooter because he couldn't take the scooter because it's also electric. So he would get shocked, which is dangerous. So, yeah, Yoshida. This is an interesting one. Pat, where, who, who's, who's, which player's bones would you replace with electricity? Do I have that right? Let me go back to Yeah, this. yeah. No, you got that right. You got that's <laughs> That sounds like Murph. You got it. We're taking um, that. Can you imagine how fucking fast Jaron Duran would be if he was made of electricity? Oh, that's an interesting one. You're taking an already three, fast guy. 3,000 bags a year. He he could roam the outfield alone. I'm going yeah, nice I'm going Jaron Duran. Nice, nice picks on who's going to lead the team in steals. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> shut up, dick. <laughs> that one's over. Oh, yeah. That, I, yeah, I concede that. That's over. As for who I would replace with electricity... I'm trying to imagine what Rafi Devers' game would be like if he could move a little bit quicker. I think it would improve his base running for sure, but like also potentially his defense. So who knows? Rafi Devers with electricity, he might be like that, like the best player in baseball. So I'll go with that one. Uh, next one comes from Noah, and Noah says. Before the season started, he had a, an optimistic 84 win prediction. It's still very early, but goddamn, the rotation looks good under Bailey. Hauk looks supremely confident, and Pavetta's stuff was nasty. The offense always plays better at home, but hopefully, this A series will get everyone on track. Cautious, cautiously optimistic, but I'm all in until proven otherwise. You guys shared Noah's sentiment there? Yeah, I think Hauk, and people are going to think I'm joking about this, Hauk deserves a ton of credit for that Monday game because it's so easy to be up 6 nothing. You're in Oakland. They can't hit. It's a pitcher's ballpark. There's nobody there. It's so easy to lose focus in a game like that, but he didn't. He stayed locked in. He did exactly what you would expect him to do. So I agree. Hauk did look great. All the guys have looked great, but I wanted to give a shout to Hauk for that. That was very good. Well, We'll deep dive into that once we get to our recap. But uh, yes, I do agree with the sentiment. Pat, yeah. where are you at? I agree. I feel like anybody who was optimistic on kind of the outlook on the season ahead of opening day, ahead of seeing the first turn through the rotation, um, it's hard not to be just as much, if not more optimistic. I think... Again, I, I, they're not going to carry a one two nine ERA all season long. But if they're a team that is legitimately in the top 10 in bullpen and starter ERA, the outlook of this team looks a lot better. And 84 wins at that top 10 ERA, top 10 in walks, top 10 in strikeouts. Like If you have a very good staff, which was the question mark. Yeah, I, I mean, 84 wins is looking good if everyone keeps kind of growing and maintaining and everything like that. But yeah, no, I am exponentially more optimistic after the first time through. I'm Pat, also sorry. Go ahead, Sammy. No, no, Sammy. Go. Pat, the, the team ARA is 1.29, correct? I think the rotation is 129 and the bullpen is 165. The okay, overall I, is I might have that okay, okay, the overall yeah. is 142. That yeah. could go up two entire runs. And yeah. they would still be elite. That's yep, why yeah. I feel good. 
No, I, I think you have to feel good right now. Like I'm obviously way more optimistic than I was a week ago, but the reason I'm still a little bit hesitant to get them into the mid 80s in my win projections is that A, the rotation is still one injury away from being like, who knows? Because someone goes down, now you've got Cooper Criswell in there and he looked good in his first AAA start and he looked good all spring training, but this is still a guy who kind of tops out at 90. And then after that, it's what? Like Richard Fitz or maybe Chase Anderson's spot start. So like there's not a ton of great starting pitcher depth there. No elite prospects ready to come up and start games for you if someone goes down. And then I'm also still a little bit skeptical of the offense until I see Trevor Story pop off for a week or like obviously I don't think Costas is going to stay cold forever. But like I'm still a little bit skeptical about the offense. So I like I'm I'm way more optimistic than I was. Like I, I'm willing to admit that my 78 win prediction prediction feels low right now, but like all it takes is, and we saw it with Devers being out of the lineup. All it takes is one injury on either side of the ball to feel a hell of a lot less optimistic than we do right now. Hey, also, I don't know if you guys saw, I want to give a shout out to a friend of the program, uh, Jordan Leandre. May, he made a, like a hype video for Chase Anderson. Hey! <laughs> Chase Anderson is coming into the game. It's him with like music and everything. I got a kick out of that last night. So That's good awesome. stuff. Jordan. Chase Anderson, he has a zero ERA with the Red Sox, three scoreless innings, and a save. Chase Anderson is coming into the game. <laughs> He's coming in. All right. This next one comes from G Gore. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, he asks, what's the chances of Durant stealing 50 plus bases this year? 100%. I was going to say, give me a number. Give me a number. Now you're at 100? 100. Actual, actual Pending health. health. Pending health. 100%. Well, you got to factor that in, idiot. I'd say like 50 50. Right now, that's such a lame answer. I'm sorry, but that's where I'm at. I have no idea. He could get hurt. He could hit a cold stretch. He could start getting thrown out. Nah, he couldn't get thrown out. That's crazy. But <laughs> I don't, yeah, I, 50 is so much. That's, I want to say like 60, 70%, but I'm right on the fence. Boring ass answer for me. I would say, hmm, I think there's a 75% chance that he does it. And the reason I'm I'm that optimistic is that they're still leading him off even with a lefty on the mound. So he's going to play and be that leadoff guy every day. And it's felt like every single time he's gotten on first, he's taken off. And he's got a lot of confidence. He didn't used to have that level of confidence running the bases. Like We used to talk about Jaron Duran being the super fast guy who didn't really use it to his advantage on defense or on the base paths. And it was just like he's so fast, but it's like he doesn't utilize it. But now he does. He's very confident. He's very aggressive. I think he I think he gets to 50. Leading off for this team, they're going to be aggressive. They know they're going to have to run to score runs. So I like I like his chances. Well, Bryce Harper has three home runs today. Jeez. What the fuck? He Grand slam. coming into today was 0 for 11. That's wow. He now has three home runs and six RBI tonight. It's almost like even the best players get into slumps. Just true. Classes. Not worry. All right. This next one comes from Josh. Josh says, was super disappointed to see Kenley not pitching in the third Seattle game. Just grow a pair and get out there. You're the closer. Curious your fellow's thoughts on this. Thanks, boys. This is an interesting one. Because we didn't – we, like – we forgot to get into this on our last episode, the Kenley discussion. Because Kenley did not come into the game in game three. The Red Sox were up three to one in the, t in the tenth. Kenley was unavailable. They put Joely in. Joely blows the game. Uh, Kenley comes and says to the media that he slept funny and that his back was bothering him. And that is why he was unavailable that day. And Red Sox Twitter kind of freaked out about this. Um, yeah. I, I have one question for everybody who's upset with him. What would you have prefer he do? It's the third game of the season. Do you really want the 36-year-old expensive closer who you're probably going to trade at the deadline? Do you really want him to try to pitch through a back issue? It's one game. It's the third game of 162. And people are mad at him for saying, hey, 
I've been in the league for a long time. I know my body. I'm not feeling great. My back, which by the way, is very important for pitching. It's not feeling great. I'd rather miss this game rather than aggravate something and miss 10 games. And by the way, he's good to go now. So I don't get what was, what's a better alternative than being honest and not pitching and not getting hurt. Please. No, I, I'm, I'm on board with you, Sammy. And it's weird because I feel like we're in the minority. Like Red Sox Twitter was kind of guns a blazing against Kenley. And I didn't think it was deserved. Like if you're hurt and it's the beginning of a regular season, it is game three of the regular season. Like right. I think people just like, I think because Kenley expressed disappointment about being lied to and like he never even requested a trade. He didn't come out and say trade me. We think but he wants way, to trade. Why is that relevant? How is that? No, at but all that's relevant. It's that's like, leading it to people. Bad. Like that's leading to people thinking that he's ducking the game because he doesn't want to be in Boston. But that 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 just is that cannot that is no he that is the such game a and doesn't pitch that decreases the chances of him being traded somewhere else. It makes no sense. There's no logical complaint about Kenley. He got hurt. You think he doesn't want to be out there? He does. His whole thing is he wants to be the last guy on the mound to win the World Series. That's what he cares about. He's not like, oh, man, I want to make more money. I want this. Like, he's a gamer. He's not happy to be out of the game. I just don't get it. Like, what? It's such an unrealistic expectation. And then everyone's like, just pitch. And then what if he gets hurt? Then you're right. even angry. It just how many times? No People how just want to be mad at somebody. I agreed. It's, yeah, the game gets blown and they want to get mad. But how oh, this, many times oh, here comes God. this guy? I can tell what, by the what? I can tell by the smug look on your face. <laughs> Say, so you no, you bring up it. you bring up the point where it's why are people getting mad if like he's just going to be here until like you like he's just going to be a guy that you end up moving at the trade deadline, correct? If he pitches well, if he if pitches you're able well, to move him, yeah, if, and and if he's healthy, he has to be healthy, right? So do you think? And like we were talking this whole offseason, like, hey, everything has to go according to plan for them to be a playoff team, correct? Yes. Yes. So, and then like at the end of the day, it's up to him. And like that's why it frustrates me. And I think it's more of all we heard was that he was frustrated that he wasn't getting moved to a competitive team. And you don't really spend spring training Did i'm not gonna that, say though? that he was protesting during spring training by not doing too much but he wasn't out on the field and he was pouting around a whole lot so i think there's a bit of correlation there that he's on a bit of a strike for himself and him saying that hey like if you're not going to trade me i'm not going to put like my balls on the table for you i think that's a dumb way to do business um and that's to say like hey he may he may very well be hurt um but with the lack of action that he's seen, I think it's pretty tough for him to be hurt. And in that case, yeah, I'm pretty frustrated that a whole lot of money is being spent on him. But in the sense of if we're going to move him at the trade deadline, either way, if he's hurt at the trade deadline, you're not moving him. If he's not doing anything right now at the trade and just continues to do that, you're not really moving him to a contender. So it's, this is just like a stalemate. This is just a stalemate on both sides. Like I think we I all admit. I like, think that's a stretch. I don't think it's. A, I just that's think he was hurt. He, wasn't yeah, I, uh, he did this a bunch last year too. And last year he was happy go lucky. He was so excited to be in Boston. The only reason that's changed this year is because he got lied to. I don't. I don't even think he was like disappointed that he wasn't traded to a contender. By I think the way, he was disappointed that he was told that they were going to go go for it this year, and then they didn't. And I, he was in trade rumors. It just rubs me the it rubs me the wrong way complaining that you're not on a contender and then you start off the season not helping your team out. But that's what hurt. like it's not his fault though. But we're we, we you, you just had like, all you just had all off season to be healthy and get healthy for the start of the season and you can't come out of the gates ready. That shows me that you might have been lazy. What? It's either. Oh, he's 36 years old. He has a back issue. He was ready to go the next day. Then retire. Then retire. Because then you're the issue. No, I mean, like, that's, that, that is. See, this like, is always like, what it comes to. When, when we have these Kenley arguments about that game with anybody, it all, you always back the, like, anti-Kenley group into a corner. And then they go, 
well, fuck him, just pitch or just retire or something because it makes no sense. Because Hold you're on complaining a second. that you're you're complaining that your organization isn't doing all that it can to win. And the organization Correct. is saying, hey, we are trying to win in the future and not at the expense of like what we're trying to do in the future. Like, well, we'll try to win right now. We're going to do the best that we can to put together a team. You are a part of that. Go out and do your job. And he's just pissing and moaning and saying, well, we need more. I don't know. Nut up and be enough. Dude, That's dude, what didn't do dude, that. Hold on. Hold on that. a second. Hold on. Devers. And this this is going to be a point you're going to have to you're going to have to go away after I make this point. Right. Devers complained that they didn't do enough devers missed the game injured devers missed the next game injured i still i still think and devers is pretty lazy with a sword oh! I, never, I, never, <laughs> I never said devers isn't lazy Easy. he's a big boy he's a big <laughs> boy after he got his money not 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 before I, I i'm gonna put lightning in his bones and then he'll be zipping around no, in, no I, don't, injuries. I don't get this kenley and devers we're saying the same shit that we were saying. All this is the same city that agree. would like moan and gripe Hold about on. Manny, but still love him. We don't make sense. We acknowledge that. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Pat has been quiet. We need Pat. Pat. The way I see it is this. Let's say, you know, hypothetically, Kenley maybe was milking a stiff back. Okay. If you're the Red Sox, do you call that bluff? Throw him out there, maybe compromised. And then he throws his back out. Then, you know, he's out for a couple of weeks. He comes back. He's got to ramp back up. Th that's, imp you know, the health is an issue. Or do you just say, you know what? It's game three of 162. Maybe he's got a stiff back. Kenley's health is crucial this season because if the Red Sox are sneaky good, you're going to need a back eye, a backdoor guy to come in and slam the door closed which, you know, Kenley would have to be healthy for that. Or if the season goes down the tubes, you're trying to recover anything you can for an impending free agent, you got to move him at the deadline. Kenley's got to be healthy. So if he's saying he has a stiff back, even if he was lying, I don't care. You don't call that bluff because him healthy to help you win and him healthy to get a haul at the deadline are equal in my eyes. You don't risk anything with him. So no, he should not have pitched game three of 162 in a season where his health is ultra important. What I'm actually baby? surprised what that there's there's three of us on this show that feel that way because if you but if you judged it by Red Sox Twitter, it felt like 75 to 80 percent, and like it was like people whose like opinions, like I Carabas respect, was like, coming after him. Yeah, Carabas, like yeah, and I'm not saying that these people are are back. invalid. Carabas ran it back on Section 10 to his credit. He kind of. Not ran it back, but he like toned it down. He he was like, I was emotional, which happened. So credit him for that. But yeah, I agree. But it's People it's a fair we... opinion though. It's a you're like allowed to have like I, I'm just surprised. Like I don't yeah, know. Me too. You would think that the I don't know. I don't know. We complain to be about completely honest. It's more of just like frustration with like how the season is going. Like it's the scapegoat thing. Like yeah. I just everything else is going pretty well right now, and I have nothing to complain about. So it's just like that's that's my boogie then, man. Kenley, then Kenley says, showed up and kind of rained on the party a bit. In the post-game thing, he goes, it's frustrating, man. What can I do? And people are like, fuck this guy. What is he supposed to say? Well, no, this is, is like Chris Sale with the accountability. Like, at some point, you just get, like, fed up. And it's just like, yeah, we understand. Sure, it all sure. sucks. Of course, of course. I, I agree at a certain point. But this is, like, the first time that people have had an issue. When he complained in the offseason, everyone was like, hell yeah, Kenley, preach. Yeah. I love it. And now everyone's like. He was bitching and moaning all off season. So were you? Yeah, we all were. This is that. God. What's the uh, What's the Dark Knight quote? You You live long. You enough. die a hero, or you live yeah. long enough. Uh, live long enough to see yourself become a villain. You either You, you either die in the village, or you become a hero long enough. Or it are you takes a about family to raise a village just before the dawn. It takes a family to raise a village. <laughs> Yes, a wise man did once. A wise We're out here docking, up. boys. Dock up. <laughs> Dock up in that village. Hey, these boys are docking right now. Oh. We're docking right, do we have socks. any other voicemails? Yeah, do we have any? You know, let's let's uh, let's get a voicemail up in here. We we've got time for a couple. Hey, boys, uh, it's Westy coming to you from Chicago, um, in Wrigleyville. Looking at Wrigley as we speak. Happy baseball. Happy to have baseball back. 
Um, so I know our boys have gotten off to a solid start, you know, um, right about where we expected. So just looking at the schedule ahead, what at what record do we start to take this team seriously as a potential great team, not necessarily a good team? Like, where's that threshold where we start to be like, all right, this team might actually be something? Or am I just getting ahead of myself a week, less than five games into the season? Um, I'll hang up and listen. Hey, boys. Uh, it's... Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, on it, on it. Um, Walk it back. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. That's a tough question. He said for... great. Yeah, it's a good question. Appreciate that one. Our friend in Chicago. Um, Wrigley Bill. That's, yeah. a, that's a big, that's a big time vibes question. We've seen teams like the 2017 Red Sox with a really good record that we were just like, these guys got no fucking shot. Come on. So I need to feel it right now. I feel really good, but you have to have a good record. And then on top of that, you have to have that feeling of these guys love each other. These guys battle for each other. They're clutch. They don't freak the fuck out when pressure hits. You need a lot more than just a record. So uh, again, I'm going to completely give a lame answer and say, I don't fucking know. Probably like, if they're 10, 15 games over 500 at the deadline or something, I'm not sure. But it, it's it's a big time vibe dependent question. I have a question. When when do college graduations occur? May. May, like middle of May. Yeah. Okay. Because at that time, at this at in the middle of May last year, then I just remember there were a bunch of college graduations. The Red Sox were playing the Phillies, and. They looked freaking great. And I was like, this is a World Series contender right here. And they weren't. They weren't a World Series contender. So I, it cannot be before then. If we're talking about great, I think you have to at least be into, I will say July 4th. If they are like, if, if they're like in first in the division, then you can call them great if it's July 4th. First place. Yeah. Pat? So I have this schedule up. The dilemma with kind of the litmus test in terms of a deadline to know when these guys are legit, if they are legit, April does them no favors. They probably have the easiest month of April in Major League Baseball. They have two more with the Athletics, three with the Angels, who are not good, three with the Orioles, which is, will be a good series, favors to win the division. Then they immediately go three with the Angels, not good. Four with the Guardians, not good. Three with the Pirates, they're undefeated right now. They are not good. Three with the Guardians, again, they're not good. And then they end with three with the Cubs and one with the Giants. So your look, to me, you're already in May at that point. Because I don't care what their record is after April 30th. Whatever it is, ha carries no weight. That's a pretty easy schedule. They should be over 500 at that point. May things pick up a little bit. They have the Giants, the Twins, the Braves, the Rays, the Rays again, the Brewers, the Orioles. So at the end of May, if they are, I would say, 8 to 12 games over 500, that's when you can start to think this team might be pretty good. But I'm with you guys. I think July is the true barometer. I think July, if they are ten hovering around that 10 games over 500, Come July 4th, the deadline, that's when it's okay. We've seen this for long enough. There's something here. They might be legit. That's just me. Because okay. April, to me, carries absolutely no weight based on that schedule. April is so much more about, like, what are we seeing from the pitching? Like, yes. Because if, if you keep seeing this, then it's like, okay, like, we can. The, the, the flip side of that is we'll know a lot about the offense come the end of April. Because if they're facing these shit teams and guys aren't hitting, they're not just going to start hitting against the Orioles, the Rays, the Yankees, the Blue Jays, the Astros. They got to get going by the end of April if they're going to ever get going during the season. Yep. Let's get it. Let's get another voicemail. I think we have time for like one or two more before we uh, do some enough said and get out of here. Oh, hi there. What up, Play Tessie? Mike from New Jersey here. Hope you guys are doing well. I'm glad I typed the phone number in right to call you guys. Um, anyway, if I was on an island, I would pick Juan Soto, 
Oswaldo Cabrera, Aaron Judge, um, you know, basically the whole Yankees because they got that championship DNA this year. You know, we're 5-0 and already, and we, Judge hasn't even gotten cooking. We're going to put up runs. Matt Blake and the pitching factory are going to figure it out, limit runs, get them to a minimum. All right, and we're gonna- All right. cut this guy, Coop. Cut this guy. This guy. This is a friend of mine who I have broken bread with. I've taken him to Fenway. And he calls in and leaves a Yankees message. What an asshole. Uh, no, but yeah, uh, that's a good. Are you scared? Are you scared of them? I mean, of course. They, they got a loaded talent-wise roster. It's just about keeping it all together for them. I mean, Judge could go down and nobody would be shocked. Garrett Cole, who the fuck knows what's going on with him? The Yankees are so, so weird with their injury information dissemination. That is a tongue twister. Yeah, they just they like tell you it's like they're a hockey team. They don't really tell you. They kind of tell you, but they don't tell you. What was he had an abdominal issue? And then Cole, people still have no clue what's up with him. So I don't know. I have no clue. The Yankees look good to start. They also beat good teams too, Astros and friggin' Diamondbacks. Yeah. uh, We'll see. But uh, Mike, uh, lovingly, fuck off, buddy. I'm I'm nervous about them. I'll keep it short. I'm a little nervous about them. They definitely like feel like they have kind of that winner's spark, if that's the right word. Like that they, that kind of it factor. But that said, I think their pitching is going to fall apart. And if Garrett Cole doesn't come back, they don't have a ceiling. So I'm hanging my hat on that. I am nervous about them, but I think there is a limited ceiling until Garrett Cole comes back and proves he's healthy. Oh. Pat, where are you at on that? Well, one more uh, thing. Yeah, I had a comment on the Matt Blake pitching factory. Is Matt Blake the same pitching coach who oversaw Carlos Rodon when he pitched 14 games with a 6.85? Would that Dude, also be Matt- the same pitching coach who oversaw Clark Schmidt through 32 games who had a 4.64? Or would that maybe be the same pitching coach who oversaw Nestor Cortez through 12 games with a 4.97? That, yeah. That's, that's what uh, I was we're over say. here with a one two nine ERA, pal. We know a thing or two about pitching. All right, dude. Yeah, Matt Blake eight years Mike. ago was like the pitching coach of of freaking Massachusetts high school kids. Like he was coaching my teammates like eight to eight to ten years ago. That's wild. Yo, by the way, Pat, I was gonna say um, you covered it beautifully. Can we stop with Nestor? This guy sucks. Oh, he's so he bad. Sucks. He sucked for over a year now. He had one. Flash in the pan. I can't. Didn't he make an all star team? Oh, he sure did. Remember, they mic'd him and 22. Trevino. How the hell were they both oh. all stars? That's ridiculous. Trevino, Trevino, at least, was at the time like a platinum glove catcher. This guy, Nestor, blows. He throws pus. He, he has sucks. stupid shoes. His mustache looks like a, ugh, like a caterpillar, a disgusting caterpillar yeah. that I hate. Yeah, uh, I get, I he's that. a great guy. I get it. He's a funny guy. Yankees players are historically a little bit robotic. So great. You have a funny guy, but he sucks. Let's stop pretending he's good. Socks. All right. We got time for one more voicemail. Let's get one more and then we'll do some enough said. We apologize if we didn't get to you. We'll get to you on the next one. Hey boys, Mark here again. Now, I know we all want to send probably Joe Ellie most, but maybe Willier too, on a uh, pillory shaped spaceship out to the Oort cloud. And I'm not talking Caleb's farts. I'm talking out beyond Pluto. But that gives me a chance to bring up Pluto a little bit. You know, it's not recognized as a planet anymore, but still deserves the same recognition for the work that it does in supporting the team. And I'm just thinking of the Red Sox solar system, of who in that deserves more recognition. Um, could be for the season, for a career. I was thinking Fred Lynn, just for that commercial he had with the two hot chicks. Um, maybe Jaron Duran for going blonde, that's hot. Um, could be Tyler O'Neill and his big old biceps, not as big as uh, Pat Big Bicep Brown. But I did hear that his dad was in the – in the running or maybe he actually was i don't know i'd have to do more research into whether tyler o'neill's dad had anything to do with mr canada um (laughs) not sure if you guys have heard anything about that um you were mr canada yeah i've said um enough to end this and i will hang up and listen 
dude, who, what? Hey, boys, what, my, what, just, what? Did he what? have a fucking question? What just no, happened? he just talked about Pluto. Who, where does he I buy think, his? I, <laughs> I think he, his question was, what's the num like the hottest in the Red Sox solar system? Oh. Uh, is that, he just thought, started talking about attractive Red Sox players. Who's very right. handsome? I, I will go with Thick Willie because he's got that ass. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, thick Willie because he's got that ass. <laughs> Pat, well, whose ass do you got? No one talking about Bobby Dahlbeck. Oh yeah, he's handsome. God damn. Actually, you know Ben Attendee. Little, little, little secret. <laughs> I, I, I can't like. I kind of forgot that Bob was on the team until he said that, to be totally honest. Yeah, I'll be honest. I thought he was down at AAA, and then I saw him on the tarmac the other day when they traveled to Oakland. I, I He's in the lineup. That. We're recording on Tuesday. He's in the lineup tonight. A good matchup for him, actually. Yeah. Uh, Alex Wood. Don't and say now it, Sammy. Don't drop. say it. This will drop, and Bobby will have gone over five with four Ks, and I'm going to look like an idiot. But Don't say it. Come on, Pat. Who's – who's? Uh, I don't know. what. I don't even know. Who's hot? Good question. Chris I'm, going Murphy. With the, I'm going with the slim man. I'm going AC. Ooh. AC's oh. looking lean. Hell Not yeah. Thick cutter. Yeah, cutter got what cutter did you got... just say? Thick cutter. What'd you think I said? Never mind. I <laughs> drop it in the chat. Anyway, <laughs> what does thick cutter yeah. sound like? Thick Sounds like cutter. a wide Middle Eastern country. Oh, oh, Qatar. Yeah, that's oh, yeah, of course. That's just pun. Oh, yeah. yeah, Pat, it does sound like that. Yeah. Yes. Got one of those. Um, all right. Yeah. Let's uh yep. let's move to some Nuff said. Um in lieu of Nuff said today, uh, I just think it's a good idea to uh reflect a little bit, talk a little bit uh, about Larry Lucchino who sadly passed away either this morning or last night. I'm not sure exactly when, but his, his family announced it this morning. He was 78 years old. Um, a pillar, not just to the Red Sox organization, but to baseball and professional sports. Um, for me, I guess the only thing I would want to say here is that as a kid and like growing up, going in high school, like becoming a smarter fan, uh, Back then, I like didn't think that, like I thought Larry Lucchino's hard nosed and like demanding persona was bad for the team because I thought it didn't let people do their jobs. But as I've gotten older and now as we've seen how ownership has evolved, you see how valuable that persona is, how important having that person in the organization is, how important it is to have someone at the top who cares so much about wins and losses, about putting a competitive product on the field, who takes losses personally and and wants to win more than anything. And you see, and you've seen the last few years, what not having that has led to. And it has made me appreciate so much what Larry Lucchino meant to ending the 86-year curse, what he meant to making sure that the Red Sox continued to push their foot on the gas and continue to try and win. And I didn't know it at the time when he left, but he has been he's been missed in the organization since he has left, and he is going to be missed um, now having passed. So rest in peace to uh, to Larry, and obviously our thoughts and prayers to his loved ones, his friends, and his family. I uh, I want to give you guys the floor. Uh, anything on Larry? Yeah, it's one of those kind of you don't know what you have until it's gone kind of situations where you, I never, as a fan, I never thought too, too much about Larry because you just, you know, he's going to do his job. You know, he gives a shit and that's exactly what you want out of an owner. I think that's probably the nicest thing I can say about him. He gave a shit, which you can't say about every owner. As we all know, a lot of these guys are just in it for the profit, but this guy loved baseball. He loved Boston. He worked with the Padres and Orioles too, did great stuff with them. So just a baseball guy 
Gordo, I think you covered most of it, but yeah, man, you, you want it. That's the kind of guy you want running the show, especially in a city that's so dead set on winning rings. And that's the only thing that matters at the end of the day. Uh, Larry Lucchino was, he was the guy and hell yeah, he gave a shit. So he will be missed. Yeah. I think you guys said it perfectly, but you know, when teams win world series, a lot of the attention obviously goes to the players. You look at the Pedros, the Poppies, the Pedroyas, the Sales, the, so on and so forth. But a guy like Lucchino behind the scenes is holds like an, you can't even quantify how big of a role a guy like Lucchino has in those teams and those rings. And having a voice like that behind the scenes, someone who genuinely gives a shit, someone who wants to put the team's best foot forward, put the best team they can out on the field, and really care and respond to fans their criticisms what they want what they need in the be there for the players and build the team and everything like that and it, yeah it, you can't quantify how much a guy like larry Kino means not only to the red sox but to the landscape of baseball in his time here so rest in peace larry yeah and and sammy you brought up like obviously the the stuff with the orioles and the padres but camden yards changed the way mm -hmm. ballparks were built for years to come and for ballparks to be built. Camden Yards is beautiful. One of my favorite ballparks to go to. I always loved, I went to college in DC and I loved going out there and watching the Sox play the Orioles. And it was, it had more to do with the, than the fact that the Red Sox were great and the Orioles were terrible at the time. And I could almost guarantee a win. That ballpark was spectacular. But the thing about being a Red Sox fan and having Larry at the top is that, and like, I, like we, we've all talked about it. Like we didn't quite know what we had. I mean, it was all we knew when we were kids, but so many teams across sports have these owners that are like from different areas and, you know, it's an investment and their heart is not necessarily in it. Like they'd like to win, but it's not like they need to win. Larry Lucchino was at the top and he needed to win. And it, and it wasn't just how he spoke. It wasn't like he just talked the talk. He operated like someone who was desperate to win. And, we were lucky to have that kind of persona at the top. And yeah, it's, it's definitely been missed. Prioritizing winning. It's a good way to put it. Yep. He just, yeah. He needed to win. Missed that. Yeah. It's, it's nice that like, cause he'd kind of gotten his flowers over the last couple of years, because I think basically since, cause like he left, and then Dave Dombrowski kind of stepped in right around the same time frame. And like Dombrowski kind of took over the role of the guy who can like, like pound his fist on the table and say, no, you're fucking doing this because we need to do it. But like then Dave Dombrowski goes and it's like, they haven't had that guy since. And it's so like the last like three to four or five years or so people have been able to kind of recognize how important and how impactful Larry Lucchino's presence was in Boston. And like, obviously it didn't stop when he left. He brought the, he brought, he brought the Woo Sox to Worcester and that has done wonders for that neighborhood. And it will continue to do wonders for that neighborhood for years to come. It's just, you can't even begin to talk about his impact. It's just, you could go on and on and on. Yeah. So sil silver lining. I feel like the fan base nowadays is better equipped to kind of quantify what he meant to the Red Sox and Worcester, San Diego, Baltimore, et cetera, because we've seen the other side of it now. And uh, yeah, that's the the best I can do with silver lining when you lose someone like that. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of uh, like, obviously, it'll be great to have the 04 guys back at the home opener, but there's going to be a lot of memorializing going mm -hmm. on at that home opener. The, the Red Sox organization has suffered quite a few big losses since we last saw these guys play baseball at Fenway. Anything else, guys? Or are we good to wrap this thing up? No, nope. we're about uh, we're like ten minutes from first pitch, so yeah, I'm ready to lock in and and win game two. Please don't make me look bad when this drops tomorrow. Win game two. Yep, Alex Wood. He's a sixteen ERA. Let's see if it goes up or down. But till next time, this has been episode sixty of Play Testy. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, before you tune it out. Just remember, hit that subscribe button, whether it's the Odyssey app, Apple, or Spotify. Hit that subscribe button. Leave a comment. Uh, tell us what you think about 
Now tell us what you think about Kenley. Should Kenley have been in that game or were the Red Sox or was he justified in saying my back hurts? Um, YouTube, subscribe at WEI on their YouTube page. We have a playlist there. Uh, rate the video five stars and leave that same comment there. Helps us out a ton when, when you guys uh, subscribe and like it and comment. So do all those things. Follow us on the socials at Play Tessie on both Twitter and Instagram. A lot of good content coming out on those, especially uh, lately. The Instagram, I feel like, is just like, like a hot box for awesome Red Sox content lately. Like you could just go down that thing and like watch awesome video after video, uh, picture after. It's been great content. Uh, shout out, shout out Coop for making all that happen. He's been clutch MVP status with all of those edits. Um, but yeah, till next time for, for Sammy, for Pat, for Coop behind us. It's Gordo here. Play Tessie episode number number 60. Thanks for tuning in. Toodaloo.